Good morning and uh, welcome to this pre-recorded version of our service tomorrow, which will be held at uh, Central United at, 11, at uh, 9.30 and uh, Stanhope United at uh, 11 o'clock. I uh, just have a few announcements uh, before we begin. Um, we Our session meeting of the Monday Craft Group uh, will be meeting on uh, September the 9th, Monday, 10 a.m., until 2 p.m. at York Church. All are welcome to come along and bring something to work on. Coffee and tea are provided. Um, also, the session, our session will be meeting on uh, September the 10th, 7 p.m. at York United. And the official board's going to meet next week on Tuesday, September the 17th at 7 p.m. with the treasurers uh, gathering briefly at 6.30 p.m prior to the official board, and that will be at St. James. Uh, book clubs meeting 7 p.m. Tuesday, September 24th at Ethel Bessie's. And uh, the book to be discussed is Anything is Possible by Elizabeth Strout. A men's lunch is resuming this week. We'll be meeting on the 10th at uh, 12 noon at Papa Joe's. And also, Central United Congregation will be holding a dessert buffet and auction. Uh, fundraiser, as is their uh, usual practice, on October the 26th at Old Stun Staffnage Church Centre. And there'll be a sign-up sheet for that at uh, Central United. And those are our announcements for today, and I uh, hope you enjoy uh, the couple of prayers, reading, and uh, message that uh, I bring to you today. Uh, take care. Our call to worship. Well, come and worship, all you who love and serve the Lord, both outsiders and insiders, old-timers and newcomers, the young, the old, and the in-between. We, we come as we are, for this is God's house, a house of prayer for all people, and God welcomes each one who comes here. Amen. We light our Christ candle. The light of Christ brings healing and it brings hope. And we open our hearts to be touched by his grace. May our ears be open to his word. May our tongues be loosed to proclaim his love. Amen. I'm going to read the first part of our reading today. It's the story of the Syrophoenician woman's faith from Mark uh, chapter 7, uh, taken from uh, 24 through 37. Um, from there, Jesus set out, and he went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came, and she bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, so even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Thanks be to God, the reading and the hearing of the word. Amen. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Well, when I read that verse, I immediately thought of a photo that Deborah and Daniel, our kids, sent us last week. It was a picture of Deborah's dog, Wednesday, sitting in front of Daniel with this sad, longing look in her eyes and wondering and hoping that Daniel would give her just a taste of his meal. Margaret and I don't have grandchildren, so Wednesday is our, our grand puppy, I suppose you could say. And she really is a beautiful dog. She's a, a Pomsky, which is a cross between a Pomeranian and a Husky. Wednesday's become an important part of our family. And whenever we FaceTime with the kids, we always say hello to Wednesday. 
Hi, Wednesday, we say. She usually glances sideways at Deborah as if to ask, and, and who are these people? Well, one of the insights I gained from researching this text from Mark was how differently Jews and Syrophoenicians viewed dogs. Jews, at least in the time of Jesus, would never have considered a dog to be part of the family. They certainly wouldn't have allowed them to come into the house. Syrophoenicians, on the other hand, loved dogs. and They would generally consider them as pets and as an integral part of their household, just like our family does with Wednesday. And you can see this in the words that the text uses regarding dogs. The dogs in a Syrophoenician household, as indicated by the woman who was talking to Jesus, were allowed inside and they were given food, like under the table. Whereas in Jewish culture, dogs are kept outside, where Jews, according to Jesus, literally throw food at them. Jewish and Syrophoenician cultures were, in many ways, very different from each other. Well, our reading from Mark this morning focuses on racial and cultural boundaries, which the people in this story bump into. Jesus and his disciples have crossed a boundary. It's the border between Galilee and the region of Tyre and Sidon. Perhaps they were taking a well-deserved break from preaching, teaching, and healing, like us, you know, going across the bridge to the mainland for a weekend getaway. Tyre and Sidon were predominantly inhabited by Gentiles who spoke Greek as their first primary language. There were a few Jews that lived there, so Jesus and his disciples were in foreign territory. The Syrophoenician woman, she's deeply concerned about her possessed daughter. And she hears about Jesus, she seeks him out, and she approaches him and his disciples. She humbly bows and she begs him to cast out the demons from her daughter. Well, in Matthew's version of the story, she's more vocal. She's shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. A, a demon torments my daughter. Have mercy on me. Now, a heads up. These passages from Mark and Matthew are challenging to read because, first of all, Jesus ignores her. In Matthew's version, the disciples even ask him, please send this noisy woman on her way, get her out of here. And one would expect Jesus to reply, no, 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 she can stay. I want to talk to her. I want to help her. I want to really want to heal her daughter. But he doesn't. He says, let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Well, in the Middle East, even today, calling somebody a dog is the worst insult. So if we measure Jesus in this text based on, you know, our Canadian culture of inclusiveness, he does not uh, fare very well in this passage. In his eyes, this woman is considered an outsider, despite the fact that he's in her territory. For Jesus, she's not part of the Jewish community, and his initial reaction is not to engage with her. From his perspective, at least initially, He's indicating that it wouldn't be appropriate for him as a Jewish teacher and rabbi to get involved in her problems. So whichever way we look at this passage, Jesus' behavior is influenced by the cultural and the racial boundaries which are associated with his Jewish identity. There's irony in the story of Jesus, because if you remember, uh, if you heard when I was preaching last week about separating the holy from the ordinary, which is in Mark, and the pure from the impure, we were talking about the importance of washing hands or the Pharisees' insistence on the importance. In the previous text from last week, Jesus was lecturing the Pharisees about what was pure and impure. And he concluded that what came out of a person is what defiled them, their behavior, in other words. But look at what is coming out of Jesus' mouth in this instance. In this passage, he uses the word dog because Jewish people consider Gentiles to be impure, dirty. He's telling her that the children should be fed first, and he means the children of Israel, not her child. Some theologians suggest that Jesus was using rhetoric as an object lesson in order to shock those around him and to draw out this woman's faith, which he always knew was there. I don't agree with that. 
I don't think we can gloss over this passage to improve our view of Jesus in this incident. Uh, if we do that, we're trying to fit him into a concept of divine perfection that actually takes away from his humanity. So I believe that all people, to some extent, have cultural or racial biases, even if we don't like to admit it. You can might sense this when a person reacts to the phrase Black Lives Matter and might say, I don't have a racist bone in my body, but don't all lives matter? Well, what's interesting about this passage from Matthew is this Canaanite woman's reply and how Jesus responds. She is persistent, and she believes in a just God, and she refuses to give up on seeking help for her daughter. As a mother, she has witnessed her child's suffering. She's witnessed her becoming a stranger to her. We can imagine this mother hearing her daughter's cries, comforting her during episodes, and then having to clean up after her. And so when Jesus replies, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dog, she challenges it. She says, yes, Lord, but even our pet dog at home can eat the crumbs that fall from our table. Come on, Jesus, give us a crumb, for God's sake. She's essentially saying to Jesus, actually, Lord, despite what you're telling me, you need to know that Syro-Phoenician lives matter. And then Jesus himself has this moment of realization and he sees his biases and his racism. And uh, he can then understand her experience and where she's coming from. I like his reply in the Gospel of Matthew, a woman, how great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. You know, it said the truth that offends you may be the truth that ultimately saves you. The truth that offends you may be the truth that ultimately saves you. You may have a problem in, with Jews in this text whom we often perceive as being flawless, uh, being corrected and taught that Syrophoenician lives matter. However, the concept of racial and cultural boundaries is a real human issue and a challenge. The reality is that Jesus cannot save us unless he is human like us, capable of acknowledging and overcoming his errors and his judgments. And similar to us, Jesus in his humanity is restricted by the boundaries set by his Jewish identity in some respects. Nevertheless, he transcends them through his life as a man, as a Jew, and with the assistance of a Syrophoenician woman who uh, he discovers here that in God, there are no walls, there are no barriers that exclude specific groups of people. All are welcome. Well, apparently in the book of Mark, there are only three instances where women speak. In each instance, they feel powerless or excluded, while also connecting into hope in some way. One example is when the woman with the issue of blood touches the hem of Jesus' robe. And although she does not speak publicly, she says to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Another occurrence relates to the resurrection when the two Marys and Salome go to the tomb and they ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? And the third incident or instance involves this Syrophoenician Greek-speaking woman who pleads with Jesus to heal her daughter. All of these women exist on the margins. All of them are excluded by the societal boundaries of their time and their place. When her sermon on this text, Reverend Barbara Lundblad notes that although we may perceive this woman as a character from a story of the distant past, a couple of thousand years ago, she still exists among us today. She's the Palestinian woman who waits for hours with her sick daughter at an Israeli checkpoint. She's the woman of color uh, praying for her teenage son's safe return from the police station. Likewise, she's the transgender woman pleading for protection from violence. She's the poor, undocumented woman who fears going to the QEH emergency room with her sick daughter. There is much grace in this story as Jesus, the teacher, becomes Jesus the learner. 
through this encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. And it is quite possibly a transformative moment for Jesus' ministry as it opens up to those beyond his Jewish community. When the woman mentions that even the dogs eat the crumbs under the kitchen table, under the children's table, she might have been aware of the fact that Jesus had recently fed 5,000 people with only five loaves and two fish on the other Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee. Armed with that knowledge, she's essentially saying to Jesus, come on, Lord, just give me a crumb of what you gave to those people. In fact, in the next chapter after this episode, on this foreign Syrophoenician side of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus feeds 4,000 people, most of whom are non-Jews. In the first feeding of the 5,000, there are 12 baskets left over, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. But after feeding these 4,000, there are seven full baskets left over. And the number seven is very significant because it represents wholeness, and completeness, not just the 12 tribes of Israel, but all of humanity, Jews and Gentiles alike. And maybe Mark was emphasizing this in his gospel because it was being written as the community of Jesus followers was actually expanding beyond its primary Jewish boundaries, symbolizing the growing inclusivity of the Christian community and Christian church. Well, in her sermon, Reverend Barber imagines this woman attending that second feeding of the 4,000 with her now fully healed daughter. And she's looking for Jesus because she truly wants her daughter to meet this young rabbi who healed her from a distance. So when Jesus spots the woman in the crowd, he walks over to her. He stoops before her and he says, thank you. He then takes a loaf of bread. He only has seven, remember, but he breaks one in half. He gives half to the woman and the other half to her daughter. And then he tells her, take this and eat because you deserve more than crumbs. And that's what Jesus says to each of us today. Regardless of what we're going through or how undeserving we may feel, you deserve more than crumbs. And so does everyone else we encounter in this journey of life. This story reminds us that Jesus crossed cultural boundaries to recognize the faith and humanity of this Syrophoenician woman. His willingness to listen and to grow from this encounter sets a powerful example. Just as Jesus was called to expand his understanding, we too are called to challenge our assumptions and to embrace those who may be different from us. So let us open our hearts to those on the margins, remembering that God's love knows no boundaries. And as we go out today, may we seek opportunities to offer more than just crumbs, giving generously of our love, our compassion, and our justice to all, knowing that every person we meet deserves God's grace in full. Amen. And now we are sent out from this place. The gifts and the calling of God are irre irrevocable. God has gifted us with forgiveness and graced us with reconciliation. So go now and share God's gift with the distressed and the estranged. Christ has called us close to him and healed us from torment. We go now and we call others to receive Christ's mercy and Christ's healing. And take the light of Christ with you, especially when you cross the borders into places where people are hurting and who are seeking God's comforting presence. Amen. Have a great Sunday and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless.